Hello, welcome to our unit on circular motion and centripetal force. This really is a forces unit, but it's just different enough from what we've studied previously that I like to spin it off and make it its own little unit, okay? Because we're going to be looking, we're still going to be looking at forces and to some extent some kinematics uh, principles and properties, but we're going to be doing it in a slightly different way. We're going to be looking at different types of motion. Specifically, we're going to look at why certain objects seem to move in circles. So far, what you have looked at is objects that move what we might call, um, uh, they, they move in straight lines or they move, if for the case of something in projectile motion, they move in a parabolic fashion. We're now going to be looking at why objects specifically move in circles. And the short answer, and we'll get into explaining why this is, is that objects move in circles when the force on them is constantly directed perpendicular to the object's velocity. Now, that might not sound like very important or might not sound like it has a lot of meaning, but it really, that's the quality that allows this to happen. And I'll give you a quick demonstration as to why, and we'll look at this again also more in class. I'm just going to draw an object. This isn't a free body diagram, but I'm just going to, I'm kind of just drawing a picture and I'm going to show some vectors that are acting, um, some vectors that are associated with this object, I should say. So here's an object. Let's say that it has a velocity directed to the left, V, but the net force on it is directed, I guess, downwards. So we'll just call that F. Now, if either of these vectors, if either of these uh, measurements or quantities that are associated with this object, um, if either one wasn't there, then the object would be doing completely different things. So, for example, let's pretend that the force isn't there. This object would just move to the left at a constant velocity. If there was no net force, then obviously we know that an object will, uh, from Newton's first law, an object in motion stays in motion unless acted upon by an outside net force. If there is no net force, the object will just continue doing whatever it's doing. So if this object is moving to the left right now, it will continue moving to the left for infinity, for, for, for eternity, essentially. On the other hand, let's say that this object does not have an initial velocity, but instead there is a net force applied to it downwards. Newton's second law says that the net force is equal to the product of the mass and the acceleration of the object. So even if this object starts from rest, because it has a net force on it downward, it would start to accelerate downwards and therefore would pick up speed and continue moving in this direction. So we've got two kind of competing influences. We've got this object that initially has some velocity to the left, but it should also start to accelerate down as long as that net force is acting on it. What's going to happen is kind of an intermediate path. The object is still going to move to the left, but you are also going to see it start to accelerate down. It's not going to go, I guess, exactly diagonal, but instead, if you can see my dotted line here, it's going to go kind of like this. It starts off moving to the left, but over time, it's also going to start to accelerate down some more. Eventually, this will lead to something like this. Here's where the object started off. It'll move in a pattern kind of like this. And let's take a look at when the object is here. Now again, I said the criteria for circular motion is you have a force that is constantly directed perpendicular to velocity. So now at this point, look how the object has moved. It's moved it started off moving to the left, but now we can tell it's moved down a little bit. So at this point, the object is not traveling left. It's also not traveling down. It's traveling in this direction. Okay, down and to the left. Now, given the definition of how circular motion happens, we would expect that force to still be perpendicular to the velocity, and in fact, that's what happens. The force has actually changed direction so that it now points in this direction. And now we have the same thing happening. The object right now is moving down into the left, but it's experiencing a force and therefore an acceleration down into the right. What's that going to cause the object to do? It's not going to just move in this direction. It's not going to just move in this direction. It kind of takes an intermediate path. It starts to move more like this. And therefore, that leads to a situation where the object gets down here. And I know I'm not drawing perfect circles. I apologize. At this point, the object has... Now, because it started to accelerate to the right, it, al it almost lost, or it did, it lost that leftward component of its velocity. Now that the force and the acceleration have changed direction, the object has lost that 
rightward or that leftward component of its velocity, but now it's moving only downward. The force is still directed in this direction, so again, we have kind of an intermediate path being taken. And you can track this all around this hypothetical path for this object until you get an object that moves in a circle. Because the force and the velocity are always perpendicular to each other, that ensures that the object moves in a circle. And you'll also notice that that force always looks like it's pointed towards the center of the circle. That's a really important fact. In circular motion, the force, or purely circular motion, I should say, the force is always directed toward the center of the circle. Or in other words, it's always directed inward. Okay, and we'll talk more about the direction of the force and the direction of the velocity and acceleration a little bit later on. So when an object moves like this, we say that it's in circular motion. And like I said, this is caused by a force that's perpendicular to the velocity. It's always directed inward. We have a name for, a, for when a force acts like this. We actually call that force a certain special type of force. We call it a centripetal force. The symbol for centripetal force is F and then a little c. Centripetal force, sometimes it's hard for people to pick up. And the reason for that, the reason that it's hard for people to pick that up sometimes, is because it's not a new force all by itself. Matter of fact, if you look at the word centripetal, you see that it has an N in there and then it has an ET. Centripetal force is really just a fancy term for the net force that is directed inward toward a circles center. In other words, it's the force that causes circular motion. And the thing that I really have to emphasize here is that this is very explicitly not a what we would call new force. Okay, You've learned about uh, different forces. You've learned about applied forces. You've learned about tension. You've learned about the normal force. You've learned about friction. You've learned about spring forces. You've learned about the force of gravity. Okay? Those are all specific types of forces. This is not a specific type of force. This isn't like a new force like, oh, the centripetal force is acting in this case. We don't really describe it like that. Okay? It's not a new force, just as the net force, when you learned about net force, that wasn't a type of force. Okay? The net force was the sum of all the forces in a certain direction. Centripetal force is the same thing. Okay? It's the sum of all the forces directed inward towards, a, towards, the, cir towards the center of the circle that the object would trace out. Okay? So what I'm really saying here is that other forces are the forces that act as the centripetal force. Okay? In certain, and we'll, we'll show some, some examples of this in just a second, but in certain cases you might have, let's say, tension pointing inward. Therefore, in that case, tension is the centripetal force, or gravity, or friction, or a spring force, or a normal force. Any of those forces, or a combination of them, can act as the centripetal force. Matter of fact, that's the last thing we're going to write down here. The centripetal force could be one or more forces, the sum of one or more forces that are acting either in or out from the center of the circle. So we not only have to look at the forces that are pointing in, but sometimes there's actually forces that point directly out of a circle, and that contributes to the centripetal force. And we'll see examples of that in a little bit. Now, I, haven't, I said earlier that these are not free body diagrams up here. They're instead just, they're kind of just vector drawings. Um, we can actually draw free body diagrams for objects in circular motion. There's one tip that I want you to keep in mind. Everything else can be exactly the same, but when drawing free body diagrams, one thing that you're going to want to do, which I found really helped me in college, is you want to make the direction toward the circle's 
center, you want to label that the C direction. So right now we're talking about the axis, okay? We're used to putting an X and a Y axis on there. Sometimes you might have to rotate your axis a little bit. This time I'm saying one of those directions, whatever the direction towards the center of the circle is, it's really going to help you if you just label that the C direction. You don't really have to, but I found that this really helps in terms of coming up with an equation to represent what the centripetal force is. The reason that this is helpful is it helps you to line up the forces from your diagram to see which contribute to the circular motion of the object. In other words, which forces point directly in or directly out from the center of the circle. Got a couple examples that we're going to do right now just to get you an idea of how the centripetal force works and how we describe it. Our first example is going to be something that's pretty easy to do. We'll probably do something like this in class. Let's say you take a washer, like a little metallic washer. It's got some metal and it's got a hole in the middle. And you tie a string to that, and you have a, this washer, and it gets swung in a horizontal circle on a string. So a really basic picture of that might look something like this. Okay, here's the center of the circle. There's the path that the washer traces out. You've got the washer over here. And here's the string. And let's say that the washer is moving counterclockwise so that at some point it's going to be up here. Okay. Oh, and by the way, this is a top-down view. I know I said horizontal circle, so imagine that you're, you're looking at this from the top. Okay. Now that there is just a picture of what's happening. It's not a free body diagram yet. You know that a free body diagram has to have a dot for the object, has to be labeled washer, has to have an axis, and has to have forces on it. So let's draw a picture of the washer as it looks right now, or a free body diagram for how the picture looks right now. The washer is right here. On the, left hand, or on the right hand side of the circle, the string is over here. Which direction is the string pulling the washer? If you said towards the center, to the left, you're correct. So the center of the circle, by the way, is also to the left of the washer. So for the axis, I'm just going to do this. I'm going to put a little arrow here, and I'll label it the positive C direction. The tension is also to the left, since it's tension that's in the string. I know in real life there would be a force of gravity kind of pointing down into the page, but we're not dealing with that right here. We're just doing a top-down view. You would write the centripetal force, when you go to write the net force equations, if so you have something moving in a circle, that means you're writing a centripetal force equation, because centripetal force just means net force. You would have Fc equals T. That's the only force pointing in towards the center of the circle. There are no forces pointing out from the center of the circle towards the washer. So your centripetal force in this case is simply equal to the tension. So you see tension is acting as a centripetal force. It's not that there's centripetal force and tension on there. The tension is the centripetal force. It is the net force that allows this object to move in a circle. So there's our first example. We'll do another example. We're going to do four, so make sure you um, keep your four total, so make sure you keep enough space. Let's look at the Earth's orbit around the Sun. And I'm going to draw a wildly not to scale picture of this. So let's say here's the Sun, labeled S. Here's Earth's orbit. Here's where Earth is. We're labeling it E. And why, so we come to the question, why does the Earth stay in orbit around the Sun? Okay, if it's moving in a circle, that means that there must be some force between these two objects. And it turns out that there is, it's the gravitational force. So, if we're drawing a free body diagram for this point, we would label this as Earth. The direction towards the center of the circle in this picture is to the right from where, how we're looking at it. So I'm going to draw an arrow to the right, that's the positive C direction, it's towards the center of the circle. And we have a force of gravity in that direction. So in this case, the centripetal force, the net force towards the center of the circle, is equal to the force of gravity between the Earth and the Sun. Pretty straightforward so far when it's examples like this where there's only one force. Let's look at one that's a little bit more complicated. 
Let's look at an example of a car going around a curve. Okay, car going around a curve. Let me move this up to make sure we got enough room. With our car going around a curve, so I'm going to draw a road surface. It's going to be a weird road surface, so imagine this like, I don't know, like a track or something. Okay, there's our road surface. And let's say our car is right here. By the way, this is another top-down view, okay? Top view. And let's say the car is moving in this direction. Okay, there's the velocity for the car. Now, it'd be kind of tough because there's probably a lot of forces acting on this car. There's at least more than one, we know that. And it's not quite clear why the car can go in a circle. Imagine this car, it's going around this track, but it's always constantly turning. Why is it allowed to go in a circle? There must be some force on it pointing towards the center, but it might not be very clear what that is yet. So instead of drawing this top view, that's fine for getting a picture of what this is. Let's draw the behind view car. Or behind car view, I should say. Okay, so there's like the back windshield, there's our license plate, and our car is on the road surface. I know it's not a dot, but I wanted to illustrate this just to give you a little bit bigger, better of a picture as to what's happening here. So this car, it's not traveling, well, it's not, um, the velocity of the car is not to the left or right right now. Imagine the, if you're behind the car, you're right, right here, you're seeing the car go forward. The car is actually going into the page, okay? It's not coming out of the page like this, it's going into the page, not up, down, left, or right, it's going into the page. Let's think about the other forces, or the forces that would act on this car. We know that there's a force of gravity on the car that points down. We also know that there is a normal force upwards from the ground. So I'm going to draw it like this. I know I'm kind of running out of space there. There's our normal force. And if it's just those two forces, the car would go straight. Okay, we need a force that's going to allow the car to turn. Imagine if this track was all ice. As, even as much as you crank the wheel to the left, that car would not turn to the left, okay? The ice wouldn't allow it. You would just slip forward. You would just keep going in this direction. The fact that if it was covered with ice, you wouldn't be able to turn kind of points out what the force is that um, allows it to turn, okay? If there's lots of ice, there's an absence of friction. If there is friction between the car and the road surface, that car is going to be able to turn. You want friction. Friction allows turning for cars. What direction would that friction be in? Well, if the car would just go forward without the friction, then that kind of implies that the friction is what allows it to turn counterclockwise. So in this case, it allows it to turn to the left. That actually means that the friction must be pointing to the left. And I'll, I'll draw a real free body diagram now. Okay. Here's our car, we're going to draw our axis, so I'm going to do, since there's two important directions this time, I'm still going to call this one the y direction. This is still going to be the c direction, because by my diagram, that's the direction towards the center of the circle. We have a normal force pointing up, we have a gravitational force between the car and the earth pointing down, and we have a force of friction to the left, allowing the car to turn. In this case, I can write out the net force equations. In the y direction, I have Fn minus Fg equals May. What do I have in the c direction, towards the center of the circle? Fn and Fg are neither towards the center of the circle or away from it. They're actually perpendicular to the direction towards the center of the circle. They really don't matter all that much. So the only force that points towards the center of the circle is the force of friction. That, therefore, is my centripetal force. My last example, let's actually go back to the first example. It was a washer swung in a horizontal circle on a string. Let's now look at a related case. Let's say we have an object that is swung in a vertical circle. There's really going to be two points that are important to look at here. Okay, The very, very top of the circle and the very, very bottom of the circle. And again, let's say that this is moving counterclockwise. Okay, this object is getting swung counterclockwise. And again, there's a, let's say that there's a string there. 
at the top, let's think about what the forces would be. It's, it's an object being swung in a vertical circle. Okay, so this is the object at the top. At the top, the direction towards the center of the circle is down, so this is going to be my plus C direction. What are the forces acting on that object that's getting swung in a vertical circle? Obviously, there's a force of gravity on it that always points down. And right here, there's a string, and the string goes down from the object. It's pulling the object down. So I have two different forces that both point down for this object. And when it's at the top, the tension and the force of gravity. That means that the net force at that location is going to be equal to the sum of both of those forces since both point towards the center of the circle. The, sum, the uh, centripetal force is going to be T plus the force of gravity. What about when it's at the bottom? That seems like it's going to be a different case, and it automatically is going to be a different case because we know that the direction towards the center of the circle is now upwards. So notice that C doesn't have a fixed direction. It always just points towards the center of the circle. The force of gravity is still going to point down, but this time the tension, the string, is pulling up on the object. So tension points up. We would write the centripetal force, therefore, as Fc equals the force towards the center of the circle, T, it's in the positive C direction, minus the force of gravity because that points away from the center of the circle. Okay. So notice that our centripetal force does not have to be just one force, but it can be a sum of forces. And it can even take into account the difference, um, or into account the direction of those forces if one is in the opposite direction. Okay, so just like with normal net force equations, we have to pay attention to the direction of each force. So there's a few other things that we've got to clear up before we get to our main examples. The first is something called centripetal acceleration. This is simply the acceleration of an object due to a centripetal force. Okay. When an object is moving in a circular in circular motion because of a centripetal force, that object must also have a centripetal acceleration. The equation for centripetal acceleration is given in the reference tables right here. AC equals V squared over R. Now, there is a derivation of this equation. It does come from somewhere. It's not super important for our purposes, so I'm going to skip it. Um, but it is, and maybe I'll show you in class, but it's not, su it's not that important to know exactly where that equation comes from. But the equation itself is important. It's a very simple calculation to make. Now, just because an object has a centripetal acceleration, here's where people get caught up. They start to think, okay, so the object must be speeding up or slowing down. It does not mean that. It does not necessarily mean that the object is either speeding up or slowing down. Instead, what it really means is that the object is changing direction. Because remember, that is another way that an object can accelerate if it changes direction. And that makes sense because if an object is in circular motion, we can see just from the front back here, this object is always moving in a different direction. Here it's moving to the left, and then down into the left, and then down, down into the right, to the right, etc., etc. Okay, so it means the object is changing direction. As a matter of fact, there's a word that very specifically means um, an object is moving in a circle but has the same speed all the time. That's uniform circular motion. So uniform circular motion is any circular motion in which speed remains constant. Okay? The speed doesn't have to remain constant. It could change, but it doesn't necessarily have to change, okay? But an object that's in circular motion is guaranteed to be changing direction. It could or could not be speeding up or slowing down. The speed could be changing, but that's not required. Okay? And when the speed isn't changing, we call that uniform circular motion. So, real quick, before we get to Newton's second law for circular motion, we're going to sketch out the vectors for an object that's in circular motion. So here is the path of an object. Ooh. 
There we go. Okay. So we're going to take a look at these locations. One, two, three, four, and five. Okay. So it could be any sort of circular motion. An object is just moving in a circle. Could be on a string. Could be a force of gravity that's causing it to move in a circle. Really, anything will work. Okay, there, it was a little blurry. Sorry about that. We're going to label the direction of the different vectors that are important for circular motion. This means the object's velocity. Sometimes it's called the tangential velocity, the object's, uh, the centripetal force acting on the object, and the centripetal acceleration that the object has. Let's say that the object is moving also counterclockwise. Let's just write that in. It could be moving clockwise. It doesn't really change too much except the direction of the velocity. Okay, so if it's moving counterclockwise, it's moving in this direction. At location one, that means that the object is moving, it's going to move counterclockwise to the left. Okay, by the way, again, we're not drawing free body diagrams right now. We're free body diagrams only have forces on them. Right now, we're just drawing a vector diagram to note the direction of important vectors. So the velocity is to the left. We know that the, net, that the centripetal force, the net force um, for an object in circular motion, always points perpendicular to that and towards the center of the circle. So FC is in that direction. And if you remember Newton's second law, Newton's second law says F net equals MA. And what that implies is that the acceleration and the force are in the same direction. So if the centripetal force points to the center, guess what? The centripetal acceleration always po also points to, towards the center. And actually right now I'm going to give you the relationship between the centripetal force and centripetal acceleration. It's very, very straightforward and easy to remember. I don't think it's on the reference table, but again, since a centripetal force is just a net force, we can write Newton's second law for circular motion as the centripetal force is equal to the mass times the centripetal acceleration. It's literally exactly the same thing as F naught equals MA. We just put the little C's there to remind us, hey, we're talking about an object that's moving in a circle. I'll come back to that in a little bit. At location number two, down here, the object is no longer moving to the left, it's instead moving down at this one instant. Now you might say, well, it's moving down and to the right because it's following this curved path. I'm talking exactly at the instant of two. At the instant of two, the object is moving down. The velocity is always tangent to the circle. Tangent means a line that touches a circle in one place and never touches it again. So the object is moving in this direction. That line is tangent to the circle. That's down in this case. There's V. FC must point towards the center of the circle, and therefore AC also points towards the center of the circle. Now you see how easy this is. At location number three, the object is moving to the right, so there's our velocity. The centripetal force must be directed towards the center of the circle, so that's up, and the centripetal acceleration is also directed up. At location four, the velocity is now up, the centripetal force is to the left, and the centripetal acceleration, therefore, is also to the left. So notice that velocity and centripetal force slash centripetal acceleration are always perpendicular from one another, and the velocity kind of like lags behind. It kind of follows the centripetal force and centripetal acceleration around. And then finally, five. This isn't in one of the you know basic cardinal directions. The object is moving right now up and to the left, the centripetal force points down into the left, AC also points down into the left. Okay, The lengths of these vectors really mean nothing, it's the directions that are important. The last thing I want to show you right now is just a really quick derivation that can help you out with Newton's second law. We know that for circular motion, we know that the second law for circular motion is FC, the centripetal force, which is the net force, equals MAC. We also have an equation for AC. So I could, if I wanted to, take this equation and plug it in here to get an expression for FC that's in terms of the mass, the speed, and the distance. I should explain what these are. V is the speed of the object, R is the radius of the circle. Okay, so that's speed and then the radius. Okay, so this equation could be written as M times V squared over R. I could write that all as one fraction, MV squared over R. Now, I think it's important to know, because this seems to come up a bunch in certain problems in this course, 
This is a great equation for figuring out the centripetal force, but what if V is unknown? Sometimes they give you that. They give you a question where V is unknown. You don't know the speed. But a lot of times you can figure it out based on the other things they give you. Let's imagine you have an object that's moving in a circle, like this. And you know the radius of that circle. Let's say the object's moving down around in this direction, so counterclockwise. So, let's say you're given information that sounds kind of like this. The object that's in circular motion will make one loop or lap or whatever you want to call it of the of its circular path in a time of t. That can actually help you to determine the speed because we know that speed is distance over time. And we're given a distance r, but that's not the distance that it moves. We want the distance around this perimeter of the circle. That has a very special name that's called the circumference. Okay, circumference is given by c, and we know that the circumference really means the length of one lap, that's the circumference, and that's given by the equation 2 pi r. And as a matter of fact, that's right in your reference tables, right here. You don't even have to memorize it, it's already given for you. So we could say that the speed is really since it's d over t or c over t, it's really 2 pi r over t. 2 pi times the radius of the circle divided by the time. If you don't know the speed, you could actually plug this equation in up here and write the centripetal force in terms of just the mass, the radius, and the time. Let's practice that. This is a good practice for a derivation. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to, keep, I'm going to get v squared off by itself. So I'm going to do m over r times v, which is... 2 pi r over t, we're going to square everything in there. That'll look like this. Fc equals, I'm going to keep this off to the side still, m times r times, we're going to square everything, 4 pi squared r squared over t squared. And then I can combine these fractions together again. Since it's just multiplication, I can just kind of smush them together. That means that Fc is really going to be equal to, well actually there's one or there's one simplification I can make. I have an r on the bottom here and I have an r squared up here. One set of these r's will cancel. That leaves me with this. 4 pi squared m r over t squared. So this is the equation for centripetal force if you don't know the speed but you're given the mass, the radius, and the time. So what we've done is just a little derivation that can make, um, that in certain cases seems to make life a little bit easier, okay? Being able to do this sort of thing is important because it allows you to see relationships between different variables. We're going to practice that a couple of times in class. We'll get to the examples in the next video.